Welcome once again, and thank you for joining us for today's live webcast on elevated skin temperature screening here. This is an overview uh, from the Infrared Training Center. ITC's Bill Schwann will be joining us here in a moment. Uh, before we start, just a few housekeeping items. I wanted to mention we are recording today's webcast. So this will be available on our YouTube channel here a little bit later. I think we'll get it up by tomorrow. All of you that are on with us today should also be receiving a follow-up email by then as well. And you'll get a link to view this from our YouTube channel. We also have other webinars that are available there, all free and all on demand. So you can watch or listen to those at any time. If you want to be notified of future live webcasts and webinars, you can get social with us here on, on, on ITC Online with Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Uh, we're very active on these channels. Obviously, we have upcoming webinars. We've got our new online level one training that we're doing. Uh, lots of industry news, special announcements, valuable tips, a whole lot more. Give us a like, give us a follow on any of these channels. And I want to mention too that ITC is back. We're returning to live training here in June uh, in the U.S. and Canada. You can get our full schedule here at infraredtraining.com schedule. And also in EMEA at irtraining.eu. Our latest schedule for, the, uh, for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, irtraining.eu, as they also return in June for uh, online, or I should say online training, but more so for live training available there. And finally, a new online course I wanted to mention is our Elevated Skin Temperature Screening class. This is a four-hour short course, uh, $3.99 US. Uh, the topics that we're covering on this, obviously camera setup, uh, the science behind elevated, uh, elevated skin temperature screening, and the best pack, uh, practices for achieving the best results. You can get all of this in this new four-hour course that's narrated by our own Bill Schwann, uh, who you'll hear here this morning. And that's on demand at our website, our on-demand website at irtraining.com. And one more thing, if you do have questions for today's web event, uh, you can ask those on the bottom of the screen in Zoom. We've got our taskbar there. Uh, where you can either chat your questions in or use the Q&A option. I'll be watching those here throughout the presentation, and we'll read those back to Bill here at the end of the webcast, which will be very short, by the way. We're not going to go too long here. We know everybody's very busy. I think maybe 20, 30 minutes at most, but we'll have sort of an extended Q&A at the end. All right. And so joining me from his home office is uh, ITC's Bill Schwann who again is the narrator of our new online four-hour uh, EST course. And uh, glad to have you here today, Bill. Thanks for being here. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this, uh, on this beautiful day. And, and we'll discuss a little bit about the webinar. Uh, make sure you write your questions down or ask your questions. Be happy to answer them. I've also include my email if you have any questions and want to email us. So uh, I think we'll get started. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, let's go. I think everybody looks like they can hear us okay. Uh, no issues with audio. You sound good. I'd say go ahead and take it away, Bill. Sounds great. Okay, let's go ahead and we'll get, we'll get started here and I'll share my screen. We'll get started with the slideshow and uh, we'll get going here. So, just a little bit... Uh, just uh, again, welcome to the Infrared Training Center. Uh, this webinar is an introduction on elevated skin temperature screening solutions. Um, what uh, some of the objectives that we'll talk about today? Discuss what elevated skin temperature screening means. Understand some basic science related to infrared thermal imaging. Discuss and review the FLIR cameras that have been designated for elevated skin temperature scanning, and review and understand the best practices for executing scanning so that we can get the optimum results that we need to see. So this webinar will just give us an introduction to elevated skin temperature screening. For more detailed training, we recommend that you would take the elevated skin temperature screening online at uh, HTTPS, IR training, at EssentialMS.com. At the completion of the four hour training, you'll get a certificate of completion. There will be a brief examination 
and we'll cover topics such as um, infrared science, what it is, how it applies to elevated skin temperature screening. We'll also cover the cameras based on resolution, sensitivity, hertz, and then we'll also cover the best practices. How do we execute this to get the optimum results? So this is a very detailed uh, four hour course. They give you more information and more detail. So what is elevated skin temperature screening? Basically, it's infrared technology used to detect naturally emitted heat at the skin surface of the face to separate febrile from afebrile individuals or people that may be warmer than other individuals and to prevent uh, the spread of communicable, communicable conditions. The important part about this is that the area of the face that most likely represents the core body temperature is called the inner canthus of the eye. So that's the inner little skin flap, if you will, that is on the inside corner of the eye. And uh, it, uh, we'll, we'll go through why this is most important, but uh, one of the things to know is that this is, uh, the blood to this area is supplied by the carotid artery, not to get into too much detail, so it gives us a better detail of the actual temperature of core body temperature, not skin temperature. One thing that we have to really acknowledge, and that is that FLIR cameras do not detect fever, bacteria, viruses, or diseases. FLIR cameras don't see through anything. So FLIR cameras see emitted infrared energy, and that's very important when we talk about elevated skin temperature scanning. The other thing that's important is FLIR cameras must be correctly set up by the person performing the scanning. So there has to be a person that understands the camera and understands how to configure the camera for optimum results. There are several studies out there that support the use of infrared thermal imaging. And I think this first one is very important. There is an International Standards Organization or ISO standard 13154 that identifies infrared thermal imaging methods, procedures, and is a very good document. And the reason that I bring this up is that you should also strongly consider having your own SOP or standard operating procedure when performing elevated skin temperature screening. The other documents out there, there are CDC research papers, and this is easily accessible by just going to uh, Google CDC, research paper, infrared thermal imaging, science direct articles, of course, there's, a, there's several science articles on this as well, but um, it's important that you do your research and uh, I think the ISO 13154 is a good document to help you understand what we're actually doing by uh, screening for elevated body temperatures. So which FLIR cameras have received a 510K filing with the US FDA? Well, there are a few cameras, the 510, that have received the 510K filing with the US Food and Drug Administration. Those cameras are the FLIR EXX series. So E75, E95, the FLIR T series, the T500, T540, T800 series, and the FLIR T10 series. Also the FLIR A series, A stands for automated cameras. So this would be a fixed camera option where it's something you would mount on a more permanent basis. And the XTech IR200. 
So what do these cameras look like? Well, here's kind of a brief example of what these cameras look like. The EXX series are a handheld kind of a pistol grip uh, camera that you can easily use with one hand. They're called a portable camera. So we kind of break this into two different categories. The portable cameras would be the EXX and the T-series cameras. And the fixed options would be the A300, 600, and A700 cameras. So uh, the fixed camera option is for something that wouldn't be easily moved. Well, the T-series and the E-series have a quarter by 20 thread on the bottom of the camera unit that can be easily affixed to a tripod and could be moved from location to location for different uses. Camera versus the operator. It's important to note that the camera simply cannot perform the scanning without the operator. In order to get accurate and consistent results, the person doing or performing the scan must understand how to configure the camera and how to execute a process. One of those processes that is very important here is focus. If the focus is incorrect, the temperature will also be incorrect. And we go into more detail in that in the four hour course. What each pixel sees, resolution of each camera, so on and so forth, and why focus is so important. Under best practices, where should we not measure? We should not measure the forehead, cheeks, or other broad skins, areas of the skin. But why? Well, these temperatures don't accurately represent core body temperatures. Also, they're very easily affected by sun, wind, indoor HVAC air blowing across the face could also affect these temperatures. Some things to consider about elevated skin temperature. Body temperature will vary from person to person. Each person's temperature will vary throughout the day. Whether you've eaten or not eaten, exercise. Did you walk 50 meters from your vehicle before you did the scanning? All those things have a potential for affecting the temperatures that are measured. And that is why under best practices, it is strongly urged that you take 10 samples before you perform your screening. So those 10 samples are averaged and saved in the camera. And then new uh, evaluations are compared to the 10 samples. The environment in which the screening takes place can impact both the person screen and the camera taking the reading, readings. The screening, for example, should take place in a stable indoor environment. Air temperature should be 68 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 to 24 degrees Celsius. Relative humidity should be 10 to 15, 50%. That's 10 to 50%. Remember that you should also start the camera 30 minutes before you start your screening process. This allows the camera to be temperature compensated to the environment that it's going to operate in, improving accuracy. Under best practices, the screening area should be set up as you see on the screen. Camera here is on a tripod. The recommended distance is one to two meters from the camera lens to the individual face of the individual being screened. It's helpful to place a marker on the floor where the person being screened should stand. 
We should also recognize that we should have a non-reflective background. What does that mean? That means if there is a window or something like a plastic in the background behind the individual scan, those type of backgrounds can reflect the energy from the operator of the screening camera and the person being screened into the camera lens. So a non-reflective background is preferable to getting a good screening. Under best practices, we also need to remove hats and glasses and ask the person being screened to remove a hat and glass. Long wave thermal cameras cannot see through glasses. So as you see in the image on your left, person wearing the glasses, the inner campus of the eye or the facial region cannot be accurately screened when people are wearing glasses. Hats can also interfere. So we should remove hats and glasses prior to screening. The person being screened should look straight at the camera so that the camera can view both eyes simultaneously. This gives the camera the opportunity to see and scan for the hottest spot, which is typically the inner campus of the eye. Secondary screening is also very important. So your company, your organization should set up a secondary screening procedure. We strongly recommend that your company or organization develop a standard operating procedure for secondary screening. This is very important because it uh, will assist you in what to do should a person require secondary screening. Markets, customer types. We're seeing the marketing and manufacturing for food and, food and beverage, automotive, entertainment venues, theme parks, sporting events, and security check-ins for companies, public buildings, governments, and hospitals. Travel and transport applications would be airports, train buses, cruise ships. And there's a lot of other applications here that we have not mentioned, but this is just to give you a brief introductory into some markets and some customers that might use this technology. So that's just our brief introduction today on elevated skin temperature scanning or screening. Uh, we wanna thank you for your attendance and viewing this webinar. My email below at william.schwan at fleer.com is available. If you have any questions that I can assist you with, feel free to email me. And um, Matt, do we have any chat questions or questions that I can assist in answering? Uh, we, we did have some questions that came in and uh, we will open the floor to those. Uh, it's an opportunity for anybody who wants to ask a question regarding uh, elevated skin temperature uh, screening. Uh, you can send those in now via the chat window or the uh, question window. That's, uh, those are both located at the bottom of the Zoom panel here. Uh, while we're waiting for those to come in, let me just briefly say once again uh, that we have recorded today's webcast. It's available off of our YouTube channel. We'll be have it up here probably by tomorrow afternoon at the latest at youtube.com slash infrared training. Um, so you can access this and other topics as well. Of course, you can get social with ITC. Join us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn for the very latest uh, valuable news, industry, you know, events, everything that's going on here in the world of thermography, uh, we put up on these channels. As I mentioned, we're back to training here in June in the U.S. and Canada. Our latest schedule is at infraredtraining.com slash schedule. And for those thermographers based in Europe, the Middle East, or Africa, irtraining.eu is where you can go to find a list of courses that are available in your region. And as Bill mentioned, uh, we do have our new online course, Elevated Skin Temperature Screening. It's a four-hour class. 
uh, topics covered, camera setup, the thermal science behind EST, which Bill touched on a little bit here during the presentation, as well as the best practices for achieving results in this new application. You can get that via our on-demand portal at irtraining.com. I'll leave that up there, Bill, and go to the question panel. I see several that have come in. And uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll just take these uh, you know, for as long as we want. Let's, uh, let's see, Bernard here was asking, how long does the machine take to recalibrate if you have a temperature change at the location you're scanning in? Well, the, again, we recommend that the camera be set up at least 30 minutes in the area that you're scanning. But let's say you do have a temperature change. There is a function called a non-uniformity correction or nuke. This function is a, a manual function that the operator of the camera can function by pressing and holding down a given button on the infrared camera. For most cameras, this is typically the back button or the white triangle in the black square. However, you would want to check your user's manual or operator's manual to make sure that that is for your camera that you have decided to purchase or use for EST. What the nuke or non-uniformity correction does is applies a correction value to all the pixels and that allows you to improve the accuracy of the image that was taken. So uh, I hope that answers that question for you. But you can, uh, it should adjust with the nuke and it should adjust um, if we have a major change in operating temperatures of the area that this camera is being used in. Bill, I had a question over on the chat window or more of a comment from Ron asking about or mentioning that uh, the principle, he's understanding the principle of not using the forehead but it sounds like he's seeing a lot of medical personnel who are using spot radiometers on the forehead. Uh, is that a misuse in your opinion? Or I mean, how important is it that we're talking about here about the inner corner of the eye in this temperature measurement? Well, hey, thank you, Ron. Hey, and, and it's great to see you on, Ron. Uh, but um, remember that the forehead is very subjective to wind temperature, more subjective to solar loading from the sun or even the indoor environment. The inner canthus of the eye is protected because it's inside the corner of the eye from environmental factors. So it's been proven that that is a better location than from the forehead. Now, as far as using a spot radiometer, the FLIR T series cameras and E series cameras will provide more accuracy um, than a, a spot radiometer. Of course, I'm speaking broadly because some spot radiometers can also have uh, emissivity adjusted, so on and so forth. Good. Back over to the question panel, Bill. I got a uh, one from Nick here. Can black felt be used as a non-reflective backdrop? Nick, thanks for your question. Absolutely. Black felt is perfect for that. Um, basically, it just does not allow the reflection to bounce back off the backdrop or background and into the camera, which can affect your, your uh your screening results. So black felt would be perfect. Uh, looks like Jose was asking about how we record the data along with the visible light image. I, I guess in terms of how the cameras work, they simultaneously take both the thermal and the visual, but the visual is not really the concern here in this case, right, Bill? It's only the thermal image that we're, we're using to uh, obviously uh, examine the data. Is that correct? That's correct. You know, we, we really, the most important thing here is the infrared image. So our screening procedures outlaid in the four hour course do not deal with taking the visual image at all. It's strictly 
temperature measurement. So we're very cautious not to take a visual image with an infrared image um, because the scanning process only um, includes the measurement. The visual image is not as important. My question here is how, how, how can we collect the eye temperature using the infrared camera? I guess the physics behind resolution, Bill, uh, what is it about resolution, spot size ratio? Uh, maybe if you could speak to just the sort of the specs behind that and why certain cameras are recommended over others. Absolutely. So the cameras that you see that are designated for elevated skin temperature screening, the T500EXX series, have a minimum resolution of 320 by 240 pixels. So what that means is the average measurement, so we wanna take a measurement with an infrared camera, particularly these cameras, the measurement field of view or MFOV is four pixels. So the more pixels we can put on the area, the better the measurement. And that, that kind of speaks to why some cameras such as the C3, C2s, or 160 by 120 resolutions are not satisfactory for good elevated skin temperature screening. They do not contain enough pixels to put the four pixels into the inner canthus of the eye. So we need four pixels to measurement. That's called the measurement field of view. IFLV is instantaneous field of view, which we won't go into too much detail here. The important part is the measurement field of view. And that's why these cameras have been selected is because of number one, their resolution, number two, their sensitivity. So uh, I hope that helps answer that question. No, that's a great, that's a great question, Bill, because that just came in from David here is why, why the E8 can't be used? Uh, or wasn't on that list. And I think it's specific to the specifications. Is that correct? That's correct. The AE8, there's two things. One is the minimum resolution 320 by 240. The second thing is the camera must be able to be set up for elevated skin temperature screening. So what does that mean? That means that on these cameras, these cameras in the software have to have what's called a screening mode. And that's um, in the settings menu under, under user interface. So in order to do the scanning, we have to go to user interface. So the E8 camera is not set up for that. It doesn't have the software necessary to get to the user interface. It doesn't exist and collects and selects screening mode. Now on the T and EXX series cameras, the latest firmware upgrade actually gives you a silhouette for the person to stand inside so that you are sure that you have the right distance and the person is completely in the silhouette. It's going to give you a better screening result. And so a couple of resolution questions coming in, and that's related, I think, in some ways, what we're just saying about the E8, of course, the E8 having a wide angle lens. Justin's asking, uh, could a measurement box, so the maximum hot box, be used instead of the spot tool? Can maybe explain how they're really not any different in terms of the physics of what's happening there with temperature measurement. Well, the spot tool is measuring one temperature on one item. So when we use the box tool and we are scanning for the hottest spot, it must be related to whether the person is properly standing inside a given area. So just because we have a box tool on any infrared camera does not mean that it has a sufficient spot size ratio and a sufficient sensitivity to accurately measure the temperatures. Remember, what we're doing here is very, very important. And we want to be as accurate as possible using the right camera with the right resolution, the right sensitivity, following protocol, because our determination whether someone has, has an elevated skin temperature or does not 
is very important and can affect the procedures for secondary screening. So this is a very, um, very important process that we're, we're going into here. Yeah, whether you're using the spot temperature or the area box, it's returning the, the max pixel on either one. Uh, the spot tool is just a little bit different how it, how it renders that. Um, let's see, standards, Bill. Uh, any standards that you're aware of? International standards. Nalter had chatted in a couple of ISO standards. I'm, I'm not sure if you want to see that. If you want to check that in the chat panel there, Bill, I'm not familiar with those. I, I will fully admit that I'm very new to this particular application. Uh, but he mentioned a couple of ISO standards there. Uh, what do you know of that exist currently for standards regarding this application? The ISO 13154 is considered to be the standard, and this standard has been around for quite a while. I believe this is the 2017 revision of the earlier 2016 revision that goes all the way back to SARS. So this is the standard that we would recommend and the standard that's been out there and has existed for quite a while. Okay. Francisco is asking about camera precision. And Francisco, I apologize if I, I don't, may, might not, I might be misunderstanding the question here, but how does the accuracy of a thermal imager factor into this bill? He had mentioned a couple of numbers that I had not heard of, uh, an improvement on the precision from 0.5 to 0.3 degrees. Uh, but I guess the, the question we have to sort of address is how is accuracy of a thermal imager, which can be plus or minus two degrees or 2%, how does that factor in to temperature measurements? Uh, is, you know, how is that handled? How is that managed? Francisco, thank you. That is a great question. So these cameras, if they are properly configured, and the user properly executes focus, distance, and best practices have been shown to be plus or minus 0 0.3 degrees Celsius. Now the next one is how does it achieve this precision? It achieves the precision based on several factors. One is maintaining the one to two meters so that we can make sure that we get the four pixel measurement field of view. The also is the NETD or noise equivalent temperature difference, which determines the sensitivity of the camera. Sensitivity of the camera is determined and most likely and mostly related by millikelvin. So the lower the millikelvin, the more sensitive the camera is. As an example, you will see the 1020 series cameras generally have more pixels, 960,000 pixels, and their accuracy will be less than 40 millikelvins. And that's why you might look at the E8s and in in some other cameras that have a sensitivity of less than 100 millikelvins. So we want to make sure that we have the correct sensitivity and the correct resolution. But Francisco, those are the numbers that we've been provided with, but only if it's executed correctly in all facets of the application. Great. Thank you, Bill. I think that's it for questions. I don't see any others that have come in. Let me just double check here, and just in case one popped in at the last second. Um, let's see, oh, Barry. Barry's got a good question. Let's, let's get Barry here before we wrap up. Uh, false elevated temperatures would result in a secondary check, but a false normal temp might let someone slip by, let's say the gate, uh, was at an airport or wherever this might be at a store. He's just wondering if, if that's rare or what we might say to a customer to ensure, to ensure that, you know, I guess the question, it's a long way of saying, uh, you know, thermal imaging has its limitations, right, Bill? It's not and as we say, it, it doesn't detect fever. It's not something that's used to confirm the presence of a fever. It's just a primary screening tool. Uh, secondary screening and all that, I mean, what do you know of, you know, the protocols for initiating that? If, if infrared does, let's say, mark somebody as running warm, uh, you know, what, what's, the, what's the procedure there? What, what are you hearing? Sure. And what we're hearing is that really, Matt um, and Barry, this is up to your... SOP, your standard operating procedures. So 
you screen someone and you might see that they have an um, elevated skin temperature, elevated reading compared to everyone else. Remember, you need 10, you should perform 10 screenings to obtain an average that is put in the camera. So that person, that person's temperature would be higher than the 10 person average. If someone does have an average that's higher, what is your procedure? Do you rescan them? Do you get to ask uh, for an interpretation by a medical professional? That really is up to you. There's no set standard that I'm aware of that says, what do we do next? Um, but I would leave that up to you, uh, whether you rescan them again or whether you have a medical professional review them at that point. But again, what we're doing here is very important. So let's make sure that we follow all the protocols and make sure we're using the correct cameras when we do this. Barry, I hope that helps. If there are any other questions or you have a secondary question, I'm open. Good, I think that's it, Bill. We can take any others offline if you want. You said you had your, you shared your email there. We can also chat that out. Bill, if you want to throw your email into the chat, please, perhaps to all the uh, attendees and that way they can grab that before we wrap up here today. Uh, again, if you want to, you know, we recorded the session. It'll be available on our YouTube channel a little bit later here at youtube.com slash infrared training. Uh, there's Bill's email address there, william.schwan at fleer.com. Uh, Bill, any final uh, thoughts before we wrap up and call it a day? You know, I don't have any other questions. I don't have any other thoughts. Um, so, um, Please let me know if you have any other questions. Uh, that would be great. Feel free to email me. Of course, we do have a uh, FLIR help that can assist you in getting the firmware updated, so on and so forth. And uh, so feel free to drop me an email if you need any assistance. And thank you for joining us today. Greatly appreciate it. Great, thank you, Bill. Really appreciate your time, and thank you, folks, for, for joining us. And again, if you're if you're up for it, check out our elevated screen temperature uh, course, elevated skin temperature screening course, I should, I should say. That's at irtraining.com. And if you want to stay in touch with ITC, of course, we're very active on social media, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Stay tuned here for future announcements on upcoming live webcasts, uh, valuable tips, and industry news. Uh, but for ITC's Bill Schwann, I'm Matt Schwegler. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you online again soon. Have a good day.